great. So I'm Terry Irwin. I'm the head of the School of Design, and I want to welcome you to our first lecture of the 2017-2018 Design Lecture Series. I am extremely pleased to introduce our guest tonight, whose work I have been following and admiring since the 1980s. It's such a thrill to have him here. He's an extremely fitting speaker for the College of Fine Arts because his work actually sits at the intersection of design, art, multimedia, music, and performance. Not many people can say that. Warren Lehrer's work literally knows no boundaries, and he is a collaborator par excellence. In design, his work in the areas of book arts, experimental typography, and narrative has literally influenced generations of designers and design students. His books are celebrated for their, their ability to capture the shape of thought, integrating storytelling with the printed page. His 2013 illuminated novel, of A Life in Books, The Rise and Fall of Blue Mobley, contains 101 books within it. One reviewer noted that, quote, A Life in Books challenges readers to rethink the relationship of the novel to the image and, the, and of the whole book to the contemporary world. Warren's work in the areas of performance and multimedia arts is equally prolific and widely recognized. He has written four plays, one opera, and co-composed two audio CDs. He co-produces public radio documentaries and audio works, and his plays have been per performed at prestigious venues such as La Mama Experimental Theater, the Public Theater, the Knitting Factory, and the Theater of Workshop in Edinburgh, to name a very few. Recently, he has been setting stories and text to animation, video, and interactive media in works such as Globalization, Preventing the Sameness of the World, and Panoramic Projections for a Thousand Voices, a Symphony for a New America. He has collaborated extensively with musicians, composers, and artists, including people like Frank London, Betty Gogol Bordello, David Krakauer, Sandra Brownlee, and Harvey Goldman, again to name just a very few. Warren is a full professor of, at the School of Art and Design at Purchase College SUNY and a founding faculty member of the Design as Author graduate program at the School of Visual Arts. He's a frequent lecturer, keynote speaker, and presenter at numerous colleges and universities, and together with Judith Sloan, founded EarSay, a nonprofit arts organization dedicated to uncovering and portraying the lives of the uncelebrated in print, stage, radio, and in exhibitions, and electronic media through educational programs in public schools, community centers, and prisons. And I want to say now, if you would like to see uh, more of Warren and his books, he's going to have a very limited book signing after the lecture. Unfortunately, we have to get out of here at 6.30, but Warren will be right outside with a very few books. And if you would want to hear more, he's going to also be talking on visual literature tomorrow in the School of Design at 1.30 in Margaret Morris and Carnegie Hall, room 115. So there is so much more to say about this extraordinary man, but I'm going to stop now and let you experience his talents, talents for yourself. Please join me in welcoming Warren Lehrer. It's really a pleasure to talk with you tonight about something I've been focused on for about eight years, the life and books of Blue Mobley. I first became aware of the Mobley prison tapes from a People magazine article about the author's ongoing legal battles. While hastily cutting out the article to put in a clippings file for my Ethics of Writing seminar, a sentence in the last paragraph caught my eye. According to a source close to the author, Mobley started and then aborted writing a memoir in prison. This piqued my curiosity more than the legal story. Due to a bad case of carpal tunnel syndrome in his writing hand, the source said, Mobley began making notes for his tell-all apologia by whispering into a tape recorder during sleepless nights. 
I was flabbergasted that Blue agreed to let me hear the tapes. It's not like we were friends, really. We'd met a few times through the years at readings and conferences, but that's about it. Here now, the controversial, best-selling author, in his own words, as whispered into a microcassette recorder from the darkness of his prison cell on the night of February 7th, 2008. After listening to the tapes, which I received in a hand-labeled envelope, I met with Blue and told him the idea I had for a book that would be one part Blue Mobley memoir and one part retrospective monograph documenting all his published books, including selected excerpts. He looked at me skeptically. I admitted to him that I was going through a personal professional crisis of my own, and the idea of basking inside his work, which I had long admired, and his story, which I was fascinated by, would be a lifesaver for me. Amazingly, he agreed to my doing the book. The one or two interviews I requested turned into six multi-hour conversations. By the time we were through, Blue and I really had become friends, or it seemed like that. Except it was only in one direction, really, because I wasn't pouring my guts out to him. But that's okay, because this isn't about me. This was never about me. My job was to step aside and present evidence of Blue Mobley, the man and his books, side by side. And that's what I hope I've done. Now it's up to each reader to decide whether Blue Mobley is an important man of letters or a sellout the champion of the voiceless or an elitist hypocrite, the conscience of America or an ungrateful traitor, and if his story is a parable of the rise and fall of a culture or a swan song to the book itself as a medium. Of course, we can't begin to scratch the surface of that reservoir of material tonight. That's what the book is for, and I'll be happy to sign copies after my talk. But for tonight's presentation, I'm going to focus highlights of Blue's career on the creative process. Not so much the creative process that bursts forth from the, the artist like some sort of natural or supernatural phenomena, but how life creates the artist, how life influences an artist's creative output and vice versa, how one door opened or closed, one comment from a teacher, diagnosis from a doctor, encounter with a stranger, 
one situation leads to another without a plan or a map, and a life writes itself. And if you happen to be a writer, you can't help but write about the lives around you and the life of your times. You try to fill in the holes, connect the dots, make whole that which is broken, make sense of that which seems senseless. And I think Blue Mobley makes a fascinating case study for this because the choices life made for him were at least as important as any choices he made in his work. For years, Blue claimed to have never written about himself. Yet we discover him and the people he loves sluicing through all his books, however obliquely. I also think he makes a fascinating case study because of how varied his career has been, starting out as a journalist, becoming an experimental novelist, book artist, college professor, accidental best-selling author, pop culture personality, and unindicted prisoner. So let's begin where Blue does in his telling, at the Joan of Arc Junior High in Queens, New York, where he falls in love with the letterpress shop, a la Gutenberg, inadvertently learns the tenets of journalism working for the school newspaper, and composes his very first book titled The Grandest Art Show in the World, a three-inch tall, 14-page book about a magical experience he had one day with his manic-depressive artist mother at a marshland in New Jersey. Mother is a famous artist that no one knows about yet. You can see her work in our apartment, but for some reason, nobody except the few people we already know are allowed in. She does most of her artwork at home or around the neighborhood, but from time to time, she goes to the south shore of New Jersey to draw or just to look around. One time, when I was nine years old, she took me to a New Jersey marshland not too far from Staten Island. I'll never forget. It was a Sunday late afternoon, middle of winter, we sat there freezing in my aunt's gold Rambler station wagon that my mother borrowed for the day. There was no heat on in the car, and my mother's window was three quarters open because we were there to watch the sunset together. Shortly after we got there, my mother looked up at the sky and said, today is going to be a good one. I can tell by the atmospheric conditions and the moisture and the wind velocity and all this meteorological terminology that I had no idea my mother knew. She was definitely pumped for the occasion and excited to share it with me, our only son. We're going to have a fantastically colorful sunset today. It's going to be quite a show. Well, that was just about the last thing a nine-year-old kid wants to be doing on a Sunday sitting in the freezing cold in a dumpy car with his mother watching the sunset. But at the same time, I have to admit it was kind of amazing. It was like this huge planetarium light show, only there was no technology involved, except for my mother's stopwatch and her sketchbook and watercolors. Actually, she never touched the sketchbook or the watercolors that day, but she did keep looking at the stopwatch. In three seconds, the shadows over there are going to change from Prussian blue to magnesium blue to then to a kind of luminescent mauve. Sure enough, the sun went down a few more degrees. Then she said, these clouds up here are going to turn like a fluorescent orange pink. And she was right. I looked up at her, and I noticed her eyes weren't blinking at all. I think so she wouldn't miss even a fraction of a second. And then I saw her body was shaking. And it scared me a little because I knew she wasn't shaking from the cold, but from the beauty of watching the sun go down. And then I was shaking too, not so much from the cold because I didn't feel cold anymore, and not so much from the beauty of the sunset, but from looking up at my mother, almost in shock, wondering how she knew in advance what the sky was going to do before it happened. It was as if my mother, who you might think if you saw her on the street is just an ordinary person, had orchestrated the grandest art show in the world, and I was the audience. Blue never knew his father, and his mother never told him who he was. But Blue's Aunt Chloe, who had a few too many gin and tonics one night, told Blue that his father was a very famous man who was madly in love with his mother, but because of his fame and his having a family of his own, had to cut off the relationship. So Blue 
let his fantasies run wild in a series of books he called My Famous Fathers, bound in a bifurcated do si -do binding. On one side of each book, he described what each of his hypothetical famous fathers did to transform the world. The other side portrayed the kind of relationship that particular famous father might have had with Blue had he chosen to follow his passion with responsibility. Long story short, Blue double majored in journalism and art in college and got his first jobs as a beat reporter for a New York newspaper and then as a foreign correspondent reporting on wars in the Middle East, Latin America, and the Caribbean. He quits before he's fired for non-objective reporting. He comes back to New York, gets a part-time teaching gig, and begins working on his first full-length novel, The Switch. One morning, a Zionist soldier from Tel Aviv awakes to find himself living the life of a Palestinian man in the West Bank. His nemesis has become him as well, at least for the day. A Bible-thumping pro-life activist is switched with a die-hard pro-choice feminist. A very gay man is switched with a very homophobic man. On this one day, switches like these occur all over the world. Narcissistic Planet Disorder is an oversized book about a planet that thought it was the center of the universe. Inspired by an article Blue read in 1981 about Ronald Reagan's first meeting with think tankers about a Star Wars program, Narcissistic Planet Disorder was not only timely, it was prophetic, but it was difficult convincing stores to carry a book that stood 28 inches tall. Based on his neighbor and best friend, Samir Braxton, who refused to let Blue use his real name, the Book of Lies is a true fiction, narrated by a devout atheist and self-professed liar who swears he's telling the truth and nothing but the truth. So help him God. Throughout this one-sentence, 365-page novel, Jeremy stands atop a 36-foot ladder in autumn, painting the red trim of a red barn red looking out on the changing seasons in the year to come, as well as back on his checkered past. Blue wrote 38 feet one year after landing a full-time teaching job at a state college on Long Island. He replaced a popular professor who escaped the life that Blue had just signed on to. Blue fell in love with an avant-garde dancer named Akansha Batterjici. Having been raised by a single mother, he knew nothing about married life and looked to his neighbors, Joey and Francis Jordan, for inspiration. Having sunk thousands of dollars into producing a bifurcated book that very few bookstores would carry, Blue produces a trifurcated book about a married couple from Haiti called Manage à Toi, a man, a woman, her camera, based loosely on a couple he'd met when he was a reporter in Haiti. After Akansha's closest cousin and 3,000 others were killed in a single day from the Bhopal gas leak disaster, Blue writes a novel called Boxland, which takes place in a land where the corporation has superseded all other jurisdictions, including town, county, state, nation, and continent. Blue requests and receives a copy of his FBI file, which turns out to be a heftier dossier than he could have imagined, containing things about himself he didn't even know. For a while, Blue becomes a book artist and word art poet, which doesn't garner him the right creds with his colleagues in the literature department at the college. To increase his chances of getting tenure, Blue decides to go for a doctoral degree at a university without walls. The Phenomenology of Lint is a novel about a doctoral student who compares laundry lint specimens with oral histories, only to discover hidden truths and unexpected friendships. One time, after not seeing his mother for three months, Blue paid her a surprise visit at her apartment at the Queensbridge Housing Project. She greeted him at the door, a shell of the woman he knew. Her mood was expansive, but her body was emaciated, almost like a concentration camp survivor, her skin white as a ghost. It was obvious she hadn't been taking her lithium. 
He stepped inside. As if the sight of my skeletal mother wasn't shocking enough. Her, her living room and kitchen were covered, were covered with, with floor-to-ceiling drawings made directly onto the walls with pencil and, and ballpoint pen. pen. Human figures of all sizes and forms, imaginary creatures, birds, birds fish, fish, plants, plants and, and planets, squiggly lines, lines and biomorphic shapes animated, animated the apartment. apartment. It, it was, was the most, most astonishing and frightening thing a grown, grown son, son could behold walking into his mother's home. Blue asks his mom if she's feeling manicky. She says she's feeling absolutely marvelous. He opens her fridge and sees a bag of coffee grinds, a can of pineapple juice, and a lot of white light. After my initial shock, I had to stop and marvel at this woman. To, to this day, day I, I could think, think of no work, work of art whose image is as etched in my memory as my, my mother's wall-to-wall -wall masterpiece. I remember thinking, she's the real McCoy, my mother. She doesn't make art for the sake of getting reviews or making money or to get tenure. She doesn't even call what she does art. While my mother prepared tea for me in the kitchen, I went to the bathroom and sat on the toilet with the door open a crack so I could peek at her doodled phantasmagoria. With the tap of my foot, I opened the door all the way. And then I saw it. This seemingly cacophonous drawing wasn't just a random collection of marks. From where I was sitting, I could see that the long wall of the living room formed one very large, very round face with two eyes, a nose, a smiling mouth, a chin. It was the big round face of a man. I pulled up my pants and stood in the bathroom doorway looking out. It wasn't just a generic face. It was the spitting image of Hoss Cartwright, the rotund son on the 1960s television western Bonanza. I sat back down on the toilet and tried to remember the actor's name. I closed my eyes and recalled the opening credit sequence. da 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 I wondered, could Dan Blocker be my father? He's not like his swashbuckling brother, Michael Landon, adored by everyone, or their strappingly handsome father, Lorne Green. Now he was a father. Hoss was a son, a brother, a supporting actor, an oafish kind of guy, not a father. Dan Blocker. Fuck! Well, he's somebody a face, a perfectly fine face, I'll take it. Blue goes on to ask his mother if she knew Dan Blocker, but she acted as if she didn't even remember the TV series, even though they used to watch it together on Sunday nights. After seeing her so waif-like, Blue worries that he will visit his mother one day and not be able to find her. She'd be somewhere lost inside her apartment, lost to him anyway and to the rest of the world. The doodler is a novel about a lifelong doodler. Midway through the novel, she loses all touch with her tenuous reins on reality and falls inside one of her intricately penned doodles. Soon after the birth of their first daughter, Blue and his wife, Akancha, move from their Lower East Side walk up to a split-level rental house on Long Island. Riddled with mixed feelings about living in the suburbs, Blue writes Precipice, a novel set at the end of a cul-de-sac on Beaver Point Lane in the suburban community of Riverbrook Hills, a place with no river or brook or hills or beavers at a time in the not-so-distant future when oil supplies have peaked in the Middle East, causing chaos in American suburbs. Buy This Book or We'll Kill You is a novel about a couple of academics who, after two years of trying to get their tome on the oral history of garbage published, attempt to blackmail an editor at a major publishing house. Written originally as a goof, Buy This Book or We'll Kill You would most likely have fallen to the obscure fate of Blue's previous books if it weren't for an independent filmmaker making a film out of it. The movie, which bore very little resemblance to the book, became a blockbuster. On the coattails of the hit movie, Blue's book became 
a bestseller, his first. Blue takes a year off from teaching. For the first time in his life, he could sit in a chair and write for months on end like he'd always dreamed of. Except for one thing, he couldn't sit, he couldn't stand, he couldn't do anything but lie in bed due to a debilitating disc disease in his back that finally caught up with him. Tortured Souls, a manifesto written from the vantage point of a middle-aged pair of pissed-off feet. Try as he might, Blue can't manage the writing from his bed. In desperation, he calls Monica Modolo, an MFA writing student from the college, to help him with his next book. He tries every conceivable kind of therapy to heal his back, but he has to face rea reality. He's a full-time writer in a part-time body. He finally gives himself permission not to be so ambitious. With Monica's assistance, he comes out with a self-help book under the name Dr. Sky Jacobs. Yes, I Can't is marketed as a slacker's guide to not accomplishing your full potential. I was as shocked as you must be to find out that Blue Mobley was, is Dr. Sky Jacobs, especially after hearing him speak years ago about the inanity of self-help books. I remember him giving a keynote somewhere complaining about big box bookstores being filled with all these cat books and self-help books. Why is it self-help if you're shelling out money for a stranger to tell you how to live your life? Sure enough, Yes I Can't was the subject of a bidding war and became a bestseller for 10 straight weeks. With Monica's help, Blue, under his own name, writes, Peace is just another word for nothing left to kill, based on stories told to him by Gulf War veterans. A very moving book, but a flop financially. Blue's 11-year-old daughter, Frida, is diagnosed with a rare and potentially deadly blood disease. We learn that Frida has the autoimmune disease, ITP. We quickly transition from disbelief to hoping that it's only an acute case, and not a chronic one. We meet other people living with idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura autoimmune disease, young, old, in between, and their family members. We hope that Frida doesn't ever need to get her spleen removed or have chemo or any of the other unthinkable procedures we hear about. We discover that Frida is a lot tougher than we thought. Blue will do anything to make sure Frida gets the best medical care in the world, and that takes money. He works on replacing the esoteric writing categories in his mind with more commercially viable ones that correlate to categories that actually exist in bookstores. With Monica's help, he writes his first book in a science fiction genre about genetically engineered hermaphrodites, which in time become the gender of choice for prospective parents. The Boomerang Case is a legal thriller about a man who is on such a litigation rampage, he finally sues himself. The condition of Blue's daughter is like a roller coaster. He and Akansha want to take Frida to an Ayurvedic clinic in India, which their health insurance refuses to cover. In need of cash, Blue, as Dr. Sky Jacobs, comes out with a book about angst-ridden love relationships titled I could love you so much if only I didn't hate you. It's a spectacular hit. Blue hires a team of writing assistants to help him churn out more of these books. The second book in the series, I Could Love You So Much If Only You Didn't Hate Me, is followed by I Could Love You So Much If Only I Didn't Hate Myself, followed by If Only You Were Who You Said You Were, If Only You Weren't Like My Mother, If Only You Would Talk To Me, If Only You Would Leave Me Alone, if only I had a happy childhood. If only you didn't need me. If only you would let me touch you. If only you would have my baby. If only you were more like me. If only you would get a job. But all you think about is work. I could love you so much if only you weren't a narcissistic bitch. If only I was who I thought I was. If only I deserved you. If only I could leave you. In the last book in the series, I could love you so much if only I could meet you. So right there, you have 19 of his 101 books. With help from his writing factory, Blue comes out with anywhere between five to eight books a year. His first murder mystery, A Damn Good Plot, is followed by One Good Plot Deserves Another, 
followed by Plotsville based on a movie made from the damn good plot books. It's got a thing going with movies. Blue's daughter, Frida, had a heart that went out to all living creatures, especially animals with missing eyes or limbs. Blue had to make sure to drive around puddles in the road so he didn't kill any frogs hanging out in their frog jacuzzis. Injured birds, turtles, moths, snakes, dogs, and cats needed to be cared for at least until they got better. And then somehow they would tell Frida if they wanted to rejoin their families in the wild or become a permanent part of her family. Puss Dude, and other curiously adorable and disturbing cat stories, is Blue's singular foray into pet lit. After three years going to scores of doctors, dozens of labs, too many clinics, treatment centers, and hospitals, Frida became an expert at waiting her turn, but impatient when it came to being bullshitted. In No More Mrs. Nice Guy, Confessions of a Nice Catholic Girl, a dutiful, God-fearing wife, mother, church member is diagnosed with cancer. She soon discovers her own voice through the transformative power of hard-earned rage. In this video clip, we meet Paula Martinez in a doctor's waiting room performed by Caridad de la Luz, a.k.a. La Bruja. I'm reading this bestseller by this famous psychologist guy about the power of forgiveness. He's pounding his thesis like a 12-inch nail into my head, same point, over and over. The really annoying thing is, he's leaving out a tremendous amount of information and his reasoning is fuzzy. I can write his whole book in a single paragraph, in one sentence. Why even bother? I pick up a three-month-old magazine. The cover article is written by the same famous psychologist guy. I've been waiting 45 minutes. I woke up to the receptionist and say, I understand Dr. Crenshaw is a very important man and that his time is extremely valuable and mine is worth nothing. But can you give me a clue how much more of it I have to waste before I get called in to wait in yet another room and have to sit there half naked, feeling vulnerable and humiliated for God only knows how long? I don't really say that. I don't even get up from the chair. I just sit there staring at the waiting room paintings the large sunset watercolor, the lighthouse painting with the white caps lapping over the rocks, the big eyed puppy dog prince. If this doctor is as good in medicine as he is in his taste in art, I am in serious, serious trouble. After waiting 30 more minutes, I do get up and talk to the receptionist. Excuse me, ma'am, how much longer do you think? My appointment was for two o'clock and it's a quarter past three. I realize I'm just a patient, but I'm really not that patient a patient when it comes to waiting in waiting rooms for hours after the time of my appointment. Someone behind me starts clapping. Two or three others join in. I turn around, all nine people are applauding my little tirade. Two of them are standing. Three more stand to join them. I'm getting a standing ovation for being a pushy asshole. I'm not really sure it's a good thing reinforcing this kind of behavior. Less than a minute later, I get called in to see the doctor. Prior to six months ago, I wouldn't have dared speak to anyone like that. I would have simply waited for however long and felt grateful that my name was called at all. I've lived most of my life like a quiet little mouse. Sister Lucia always told us not to complain. Life is hard, she'd often say with the grim expression of a life filled with joyless obligations. Have patience in this life and you'll reap the benefits in heaven. Father Michael, Sister Henrietta, and Sister Agnes had cheerier dispositions, though they all praised the virtues of keeping quiet, especially if you were a girl. For the next quarter century, I pretty much kept my thoughts private. Then six months ago, I found a lump under my arm. Waiting became a matter of life and death. Waiting for my name to be called. Waiting for interminable weekends to turn into Monday when the doctor could look at the lab results. 
waiting for the phone to ring. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, till finally I'm told to come into the office. I come in, my primary care doctor asks me which I would like to hear first, the good news or the bad news. I say, I'm not a child, just tell me. He says, okay. The bad news is you have cancer. The good news is it's stage one and we have an excellent record at eradicating this particular cancer when we catch it this early in the game. A week later, a different doctor about to inject me with a very large needle says, would you prefer I sing to you or tell you a joke? Just give me the goddamn needle and get it over with. Was that a sane thing to say to a man with a needle in his hands? You wouldn't think so, but it was a painless shot and that doctor has treated me with the utmost respect ever since. No songs, no jokes, no talking to me like I'm a child. Now that I'm violating every rule I ever learned about being a nice Catholic girl, my life is taking a turn for the better. After I told my boss he could take his lousy executive assistant position and shove it up his flat, greedy ass, he offered to give me a raise. I quit anyway. I tried the same thing with my husband, but he's being so nice to me now. I'm not about to give up the special treatment. We'll see how long it lasts. Lou starts going into big box bookstores, lying down in particular aisles till an idea for a book in that genre comes to him. One time he got an idea for a book in the religion section, and when he got up, he saw that the human sexuality aisle was right behind him. End Times, the story of a sex addict turned evangelical fanatic. Lou starts doing all kinds of hybrid genre books, like his first children's book, How Bad People Go Bye-Bye, a pull-out pop-up book on the history of capital punishment. Let's take a look at a few of these pages. In early times when a man did wrong, pull the tab, we threw some stones till he was gone. Then if someone killed or stole, on the guillotine their head would roll. Nowadays a prick in the arm and the bad man can do no harm. How Bad People Go Bye-Bye was a flop until the cable news programs turned it into a controversy. Within two months, the book was banned in school libraries in every state of the Union, except Massachusetts. And it became the top-grossing children's book of 1998 and Blue's first number one bestseller. Blue describes his first experiences on daytime television programs, watching Guests pitted against each other, and audiences pumped up by producers to become a mob. We've got a really exciting topic for you today, so let's show the viewers at home what excitement is. You see this sign over my head? If it says, stand up, I want you all up on your feet. If it says, scream, and you feel like screaming, scream! Whatever it says, if it says, laugh, come on. Let's hear it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> good, good. Let's try. If it says applaud, let's hear it. Yeah, and more. Let's really hear it. There you go. What a group. You're getting better. If it says cheer, that's what we want you to do. The audience was in such a frenzy by the time they brought me on and sat me next to a woman whose son had been murdered and the convicted murderer was due to be executed the following week. I felt like a slab of tenderloin being thrown to the wolves. The audience welcomed me. Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! Thankfully, there were only six minutes left in the show. During this time, Blue was accused of being a pornographer, a propagandist, a sly manipulator of the media, uh, the truth teller, and the devil's accomplice. Dr. Sky Jacobs, becoming your own worst enemy, is not about hating yourself, it's about being in control. Only after you embrace your own loathsome, rock-bottom, mean, hypocritical, low-life self can you deny others the opportunity of bringing you down really a very positive book. Eventually, Blue's daughter 
is doing a lot better. And his own back pain is under control. But he's grown accustomed to working with a team of assistants. After a while, almost everything Blue does in his creative and professional life is the result of groupthink. His problems become the group's problems. Outsourcing grandma takes place in a globalized world where made in America could be made in the Philippines or China, and grandma could be an 11-year-old girl with knitting needles. In a dream, Blue sails through the air, kind of like skydiving, looking down at the earth. As I looked closer, what I thought were mountains, rivers, and villages were actually the terrain of people's lives, a topography of choices and chances, opportunities and accidents, forks that lead to easy or hard roads, tributaries of regrets and satisfactions. In Life Maps, Dr. Sky Jacobs serves up 101 maps and diagrams that help you figure out where you're going, where you've been, how you got there, and if necessary, how to change direction. Another hybrid genre work, a series of culinary murder mysteries, a bell tolls for Mr. Frosty. The night crustaceans screamed. Imagine if we could hear the screams of lobsters as we boiled them alive. In his newly minted position as a person with money, Blue thought he could please the people he loved by being their Santa Claus, inventing wish lists on their behalf and making them come true with great panache. Among other things, he helped arrange a gallery exhibition of his mother's art, which got a very positive review in the New York Times, three paragraphs of which was devoted to her mental illness and to the long tradition of madness and art. The show sells out, but Blue feels terrible seeing his mother contextualized in this way. He sees what it's like to be personified as an issue and considers his own culpability inventing characters and representing real people to highlight causes. He does many readings of this extended rant at poetry clubs and becomes a fledgling performance poet. After September 11th, 2001, Dr. Sky Jacobs writes a modest proposal for keeping the nation secure. The final point of his 35-point proposal involves rounding up and penning in all men. After all, if you took all the men off the streets, the world would be a safer place. The poetry roll has 1,001 two-ply toilet paper poems guaranteed non-toxic and biodegradable. Preemptive strike. War begets democracy like a blowtorch waters the lawn. White, sitting here reading, lost for a moment in eternity. Disheartened and disturbed by the direction he sees his country going in, Blue becomes a blogger, an omnipresent iconoclastic pundit on the cable shows, also writes downloadable pamphlet-length essays which become fodder for the chattering punditocracy. U.S. versus them, or us versus them, is a coloring book celebrating U.S. military intervention since World War II. It may not always make a pretty picture, but according to the jacket copy, it's time for Americans to face the on-the-ground sacrifices so many people have made in order to bring democracy and freedom to all parts of the globe. While doing research for an historical book on enclosure walls, Blue became fascinated with the field of scholarship known as Bible science. The new New Testament is a fully annotated Bible replete with the latest scientific proof of God, Jesus, and many biblical stories. Here it is packaged in a deluxe edition marketed as matters of fact, which includes actual dirt from Bethlehem, DNA certificates, and facsimiles of bone, shroud, and other sacred artifacts. Blue has a growing sense that he's living in a world where books are not as central to people's lives as they once were. That reading, deep, long-form, contemplative reading, is very likely an endangered species. Circa 2005, Tell a Vision is a book for people who can't stand reading but have an image to maintain. Maybe you're the head of a family or the president of a corporation or country. You don't only hate reading, you're addicted to watching TV. Don't despair. 
Just pull out a copy of television, a handsomely produced hardcover book by the best-selling author Blue Mobley, crack open the cover, and pretend to read while watching your favorite television programs. Blue officially quits writing and turns his writing factory into a laboratory for exploring and entrepreneuring the legacy and future of the book. No more content creation, they zero in on the form and develop a line of books for boys that drive, roll, chug a lug, and fly. They still may not be reading, but at least parents know their sons are playing with books. A line of book clothes and accessories that keep you looking language savvy from head to toe. Quite the entrepreneur by now, Blue comes out with a line of book lamps called Illuminated Manuscripts. We used to sit around the campfire telling stories. Then for a long time, books were the thing. The book, the campfire, both storytelling relics from bygone eras that can light up a table and give you a warm literary feeling. Book lamps with big ideas. That reflect the nature of inspiration. That take us beyond ourselves. That remind us of texts we used to dive into and swim around in. The ultimate coffee table book. All technologies of communication lighting up your living room. Without giving away too much of how and why Blue Land's in prison, I will tell you that he comes out of writing retirement to write an expose on presidential indiscretions, as told to him by a former White House cleaning person. Under the rug, ends up getting Blue into more trouble than the president it was intended to topple. In prison, Blue starts a literacy program as a means of survival. He grows to love the men in his prison writing workshops and admire the heart, soul, and wisdom he finds in their writings. I'm grateful to everyone in the workshop who allowed themselves to turn down the noise in their heads, telling them that they're worthless, that writing is for sissies, that everything has already been written and said, and there's nothing that putting ink to paper will get them. I ask them to write what they know. Tell it like you're telling the best friend you haven't even met yet. Fire the prison guard inside your mind and let your thoughts run free. When the, when the writing, writing stops, stops they, they stand up one at a time, time and read aloud. Sometimes, sometimes they whisper, sometimes, sometimes they, they shout or, or sing, and, and the rules and the barbed, and the barbed wire and the cinder block walls fall away. And with each recitation, these men in their orange garb and their accents and asymmetrical faces restore my faith in the power of story. So many of them didn't think they had a story still worth telling or a life still worth living. I was one of them. We think the holes in our lives are unfillable and our sins, our mistakes, unforgivable. All this time, I've kept mum, defending the principle of confidentiality. I don't want to let anyone down, but I'm dying to see my wife for more than five hours a month out from under the watchful eye of the unit officer. I long to be with my daughters, even on odd-numbered days. When I'm free, I'll treat every odd-numbered day like it's a holiday. I'm ready to give back my orange jumpsuits, my sanctioned footwear, and all the triplicate request forms. I'm ready to eat food that doesn't taste like the cardboard box it comes in ready to take long walks again, get caught in a traffic jam, wait online at the Department of Motor Vehicles, get telemarketing calls. However tempted, I will not live to write anymore, or write to live. No more perpetual note-taking, experience hoarding, idea stockpiling, or shrinking and expanding the world to fit 
between the covers of a book. If I have the time, it would be nice to keep painting, just for the fun of it. Landscapes, still lifes, nothing heavy. I like painting more than I thought I would. Blue took up painting in prison. The smell of turpentine, the bounce of brush against canvas, not fussing too much with it, just for relaxation. For work, I think I'd like to do something in a senior center, helping old people in some way. See if there's a job treating people with dignity, tease the inner gorgeousness out of the harder cases. I'd look forward to a job like that. Or I could become a gardener, working with my hands in the earth, gloveless, planting seeds, arranging rocks in the language of geometry and chance, facilitating, delirious at the thought of the first buds of spring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, and Blue thanks you, of course. Um, we have a little time for uh, some dialogue, questions, some answers, comments, and then I would be happy to let you see some of these uh, Life in Books books and have a little discount for them. Uh, questions? Yes. Blue Mobley. Uh, Blue was named Blue because he was born with a bluish complexion and his mother was part French, hence the spelling. Mobley uh, comes from Blue's grandfather on his mother's side, who is actually Mordechai Jacobson, who uh, escaped Poland for his life and came to the Lower East Side in New York and was a rag merchant. And when he left New York City, he felt uh, a need to change his name so he wouldn't be so obviously Jewish. And he rearranged parts of his name and changed his name to Jake Mobley. So Blue Mobley, who is always uh, struggling with this difference between fiction and nonfiction, actually his name was born of a, of a lie, of a kind of fabrication. Uh, so anyway, maybe a longer answer than your question expected, but, but that's kind of the story of his name. Yes. how I mixed it. OK, well, and we could bring the house lights up uh, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, how do I work on combining my voice with Blue Mobley's? Um, and well, uh, it's pretty easy, because Blue Mobley's voice is my voice, right? And um, I'm not sure if it's clear to everyone that Blue Mobley is a fiction. There is no real Blue Mobley. And so I, uh, and it's, you know, we said that it was an illuminated novel. And so everything um, is a fabrication of my imagination, his story, and his books and book covers and all of that. So when I recorded his voice, supposedly from his microcassette recordings from his prison cell. I distorted it a little, made it noisy because he was doing it on a low quality tape recorder. And um, so I was interested in the present, live presentation to play with the you know, author and his protagonist and you know, the question of how much is autobiographical and how much is made up, you know, maybe gets conjured in the minds of people in the, in the audience. Yes. They really came hand in hand. So 
I originally had an idea of doing a book with 101 books in it, more of like a send up on 101 this and 100 on that. But I quickly got bored with that and realized, no, all these books had to be written by the same author. And I had an idea quickly that he was in prison. And uh, I had book ideas. You know, after finishing my previous book, you know, I had a, a backlog of book ideas. So some of those were even before I started this project. And I started designing those covers. And then meanwhile, I was writing Blue's narrative, his story. And I would then uh, start writing excerpts of the books. So that film, that excerpt of the film of uh, No More Mrs. Nice Guy is one of several short films that I made based on the 34 excerpts in the book, which read like short stories. So I was writing these excerpts, and the excerpts, in many cases, would tell me things about Blue's life that I hadn't charted out and I hadn't thought of. So it was this very intricate kind of back and forth between doing the book covers and writing the excerpts and writing blue stories and maintaining charts and diagrams. And eventually it revealed itself to me as a, as a puzzle completed. Yeah. Say it again. A favorite. Uh, I guess that's a, like asking a, if you have a favorite child, um, which case you shouldn't really say. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm actually working on one book that I didn't even show here, fleshing it out into its own novel right now. And I don't know it's because it's my favorite, but I think it, it's timely and interesting to me and also kind of very difficult to write. But, um, you know, other people have said, gee, you got to make How Bad People Go Bye Bye uh, uh, an actual book or the toilet paper poetry roll and uh, others. One of the things, the, the presentation, although you were kind of quiet crowd tonight until like midway through, but as sort of funny haha as some of this presentation is, a lot of the uh, writings, the excerpts in Blue's own story, are uh, not, not that funny, even though he's a funny guy and he sees the humor in dark situations. And so I kind of like that contrast because I find life to be that way, uh, sort of a tragic comedy. Uh, so I don't know why I said that in reference to your question, but uh, yeah. Well, when I wrote the excerpts, my challenge to myself was to make it have an arc that felt whole, like a short story, but that still felt like it was sliced out of a larger whole. So that was my challenge to myself. But it, it's, it was great, fun, because I didn't have to write the whole all 101. I could just sort of get it out of my system, in some cases even with just a book cover. Uh, I, I originally had, I, I wrote excerpts for over 60, but in the editing process, uh, many of them got taken out, mostly to make it publishable and um, make it a better book, actually. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I've always, my projects have always been uh, where the, the book was at the center of a multi-branch project and there was always performance as an aspect of it. My earlier books were actually scores and scripts for performances. And then I came to realize at a certain point that people don't want to read, like if you're reading a book, you don't, you don't want to read stage directions necessarily. And, and I realized that, you know, what goes on on a stage or live presentation is different than, than reading, which is different than a film. And so, you know, and one of the great things about writing a novel is it's more interior. Um, the question 
Remind me of the question. Ah, yeah, yeah. So I started, I was actually workshopping the writing of the book, doing workshop live presentations. And I would see what played well and what didn't. And so I would kind of learn that way. And then as I was actually having a little hard time getting it published, a 400 four color, 400 page four color novel, um, I had a little time to work on the performance presentation before the book came out. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, I think most artists and writers probably, they just, they, it happens, the creative process very naturally. You write for yourself or you make art for yourself and then at a certain point you realize if you're lucky enough to develop an audience that there is a relationship there. And sometimes it's not the relationship you want, you know, if your book becomes a scandal, but then uh, maybe you could use that to your advantage, but usually if you're in the middle of a scandal, it's, it's, it's not a plan you really want to make. And so he, I, 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 part of the journey of Blue Mobley is that he's, he starts out with very pure intentions, and then you see him get challenged by financial needs, his daughter needing medical attention that he can't really afford on a college professor's salary, and so he starts selling out, but yet he's trying to always stay true to his principles even while he's selling out. So that's part of what you see when you read um, this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that is one thing I never show you. So that is left up to your imagination. But the cover of the book, uh, you know, I suppose is somewhat. Uh, but he even, his, he doesn't know who his father was. And his mother had been involved with people of various backgrounds. So uh, the reader um, is also never really clear what his whole sort of genetic makeup is because he doesn't know. And maybe that not knowing helps enlarge his sense of connection to many people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which you know you could investigate the depths of by writing much more under each one of those. Yeah. Um, but then you zoom out from that, and there's still a bigger iceberg tip. You know, which are these glimpses of, right. of the character, and there's so much more that you could say and do. And, you know, investigate in any number of media and any number of performances and artifacts and so on. And I just I wondered if you could speak to the uh, the momentum, if you like, and the motivation that you. Uh, appear to have in fleshing out all of this stuff and, and making it cohere. I mean, there are certain pleasures, it seems to me, in world building. I'm yeah. not trying to put a yeah. word in your mouth, but you know, in doing that, mm -hmm. that, that, that grand conception where everything sort of holds together, but you can dive in here right. or there or anywhere you want. Right. Um, maybe you can just talk about that as a motivation. Or what, what is the motivation? When I, when I was uh, in... Uh, undergraduate in art school, uh, a teacher turned me on to this artist, Jennifer Bartlett. Does anybody know this painter? Um, and I actually, we, I got to visit her in her studio. And she did this incredible project called Rhapsody. And when she was a graduate student, uh, apparently, her teachers would come into her studio. And every week, it was like a whole other thing. And she worked in many, many different styles. And the main, you know, a lot of the focus of graduate school is to, to get your vision thing together and unified. And she kind of rejected that. She felt she manifested her work in, in very many different styles, from abstract to figurative to landscape to gestural to more uh, 
realistic and, and, and always rather conceptual. So she figured out for this one project that filled the walls of the Paula Cooper Gallery a, I think, 16-inch square panel. And, and so she created this big work that uh, unified, and she had a few themes that she was working with, and it unified all these like different ways of working. And I wasn't thinking of Jennifer Barlow when I was working on this, but I, I feel a kindred uh, spirit to that um, way of, of uh, not settling on one particular kind of thing. So this kind of project was a great delight. I mean, it was also excruciating. <laughs> but uh, I hope that was an answer. Uh, maybe two more. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, he's a character. Um, he's, uh, you know, I would say like 50% me. And, um, but then again, other characters who show up are a little bit me too. I mean, my parents were funny when they first read the book. They said, we didn't know you want, always wanted to be a girl. <laughs> and I was like, what? Um, and you know, they took like everything at face value, which is really strange, because I have a father who Mobley didn't. And, you know, but they were yet taking. So there is this tendency, I think, with fiction that people think that it's pure autobiography. But uh, you know. I have back problems, and I'm neurotic, and all kinds of things. Uh, but I've only, this is my 10th book, and Blue Mobley did 101. Then again, he had a factory to help him. Uh, one last, OK, yeah. What is, how do you frame your narrative? Do you complete it before getting into ideas? Like, what is your process? Uh, now, I didn't hear all of that. Part of my problem is I have tinnitus, which is like a ringing in the ears. Um, but you're asking me about my process. Well, I described some of it. Um, I don't sleep a lot. <laughs> and I have pads. When my wife is out of town, the pads are in the bed with me, but you know they're right next to the bed, and it's like um, just a kind of an always process. Although, you know, as in that little part that I read at the end, where Blue says that I don't want to like just experience my life so that I could put them between the covers of a book, and I'm, I'm working on not being such a workaholic, but. Uh, the process, um, as uh, I was trained as a visual artist, but I always wrote on the side. And then, and then uh, pretty early on, it became about writing visually. And I just, the two are very married for me. And I, I didn't show like pages from the book, but you know, um, it, it, so, so, you know, sometimes if I'm tired, of writing, or I want to listen to the news, uh, I'll I'll work on the visual aspect of it and and that kind of thing. So, but you know, it's great when it's mysterious and you don't have it all planned out. I you know, this is a debate between particularly writers of fiction is you know how much do you have it? You know, Joyce Carol Oates says she has it all sort of figured out. And and uh, but I think God that doesn't sound like fun, and yet she's such a wonderful writer uh, because of course she doesn't have it all figured out because part of the thing is the the, the, the writing of it. So uh, hopefully that was helpful. Um, thank you so much. Oh, can I ask you a question? How many people here were are from the design?
program. Ah, <laughs> uh, 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 School of Art, the, fi the Fine Arts. Ah, oh, what do you know? Uh, creative writing? Creative writing. Uh, wow, all these questions that seemed so like creative writing. Interesting. Um, so thank you so much. We do have to get out of here to make room for the next group. And uh, well, I'll have some books out on the table there. Thank you.